Hi, and welcome to the new series 101, where we go over a short video in a small topic of medicine. Given the current climate and the proceedings over the last few months, I've had a lot of my juniors ask, or generally be confused by, both CPAP and BiPAP. This is an overview video, not to be used for exam revision, but more for understanding of how these non-invasive ventral aging methods work in clinical practice. So let's dive straight in. CPAP is continuous positive airway pressure. What does this mean? Well, it's basically a machine providing constant pressure back into the lungs in both your inspiratory and expiratory phase. It essentially gives you the opportunity to deliver more oxygen than you could ever give through any normal face mask. The indications are pretty clear. It's usually worsening type 1 respiratory failure, or basically a respiratory failure with a high CO2. And this is often used when other medication or medical attempts have failed. And typical indications include pneumonia, pulmonary edema, sleep apnea, although the last is usually in a chronic setting. It works by simply increasing the pressure being delivered into the lungs, or positive airway pressure. What that means is by increasing the pressure being delivered in the lungs, more oxygen can be delivered. Well, what does this mean physiologically? It helps to stent open some of the alveoli that have closed up because of the initial process. Whether that's pneumonia or pulmonary edema, there's bound to be some inflammation and some scarring that causes those alveoli to collapse. By delivering a positive pressure here, the alveoli remain open in the expiratory phase and that allows for more oxygen delivery and exchange. This process is basically called recruitment. In terms of settings, the basics of what most people need to know, and that's unless you're a respiratory physician, ITU or downright genius, is that the CPAP setting should be started at 4 and the CPAP and FiO2 levels should be titrated up to maintain the target SATs and PaO2. These patients would need ongoing respiratory and cardiac monitoring and depending on the patient, repeated ABGs or SATs to see where their oxygenation stands and whether you need to wean up or down. Just remember, some machines use a standing of PEEP instead of CPAP, which stands for positive end expiratory pressure. So here's a quick example. We've got an 88 year old man who's got proven COVID pneumonia and despite optimal initial medical treatment, his arterial blood gas shows on 15 litres, a pH of 7.39, CO2 of 4.1, a PO2 of 6.0, saturations of 88%. You sensibly decide to start him on CPAP with a setting of 4 and FiO2 of 40, and you monitor his SATs which improved to 90%, but at this point his respiratory rate is still 30, so you decide to increase his CPAP to 6 and an FiO2 of 40, and now his respirator is 25, SATs are 96, he's looking a lot more settled. Slightly on a tangent, if you're enjoying this video and want to see more amazing free medical content, be sure to like and subscribe, it really helps out. So let's move on to BiPAP which some places commonly refer to this as NIV. This is for respiratory failure with hypercapnia, i.e. type 2 respiratory failure. Most commonly, it's seen in people with COPD or a neurological disorder causing ventilation difficulties, such as people with motor neuron disease. The indications for this are people with severe respiratory failure with a high CO2 and a low pH, despite optimal medical management, or for people that are being weaned from the process of being intubated. The key physiological difference here is that there are two pressures, an inspiratory, or IPAP, and an expiratory positive airway pressure, also known as EPAP. Essentially, a different pressure on both inspiration and expiration. Let's break this down. Having two separate pressures in BiPAP is useful in conditions like COPD, where one of the main features is a loss of elasticity. The CO2, or hypercapnia, is measured usually in the blood. This obviously has ramifications in causing acidity of the blood's pH and therefore can be quite fatal. In people with an exacerbation of COPD, there's an added insult of a stress and inflammatory response in pretty knackered lungs already. Therefore, the rate of gas exchange from the capillary into the lung, in simple terms, is pretty poor. So how do we get on top of this? One way is to increase the inspiratory pressure, therefore technically artificially expanding what we call the forced residual capacity of the lungs. This will increase the rate of diffusion from the blood to the airspace and therefore reduce hypercapnia. Thinking of this simply, imagine the lungs as a balloon. You put more pressure in, which is the IPAP, and the balloon expands, given simple laws of diffusion that a substance will move from an area of high concentration, such as the blood, to an area of low concentration, such as the lungs, down the concentration gradient, such that by expanding the balloon, you're making the area of low concentration even lower and therefore the rate of diffusion is faster. This ultimately removes CO2 from the blood so you can exhale it. Not only this, but IPAP also helps by reducing resistance and workload on already tired respiratory muscles, therefore helping that patient ventilate more effectively. The EPAP portion of BiPAP, I'd like to think is similar to CPAP, 
Although this isn't strictly true, however, for most people, and I know there are some specialist geniuses out there, you can get away with just knowing the basics. So in essence, it helped stent open alveoli that already collapsed and helped re-expand the lungs upon expiration. This inevitably allows more oxygen delivery. So in summary, IPAP decreases CO2 and EPAP increases O2. The British Thoracic Society suggests that starting an IPAP of a level of 10, increasing in intervals of 2 typically, and an EPAP of 4 is the usual practice. To monitor response, we typically do an arterial blood gas after an hour after changing settings, then 4 hours, and then 24 hours. And the weaning process is often slower, with usually just a few hours break at a time. So let's give a practical example. We've got a patient with COPD and they've had an effective exacerbation with type 2 respiratory failure that's not typically responding to the first line measures. The team, sensibly, decide that BiPAP is indicated due to blood gas that show pH of 7.23, a CO2 of 10.0 and a PO2 of 6.6. .6. We start this patient on an IPAP of 10 and an EPAP of 4. We repeat the gas in an hour and the pH is 7.25, CO2 of 8.9 and PO2 of 6.6. .6. So what do we do here? Well, the patient is still acetotic, still hypercapnic, and still hypoxic. So we'll increase his IPAP to 12, and we'll increase his EPAP to 5. An hour later, we repeat the gas again, and his pH is 7.28, PCO2 8.5, and PO2 of 8.8. .8. All things being considered, he is improving, but not well enough. The oxygen now is pretty good, so we only really need to tinker with the CO2 and the IPAP. So our new settings will be 14 and 5, Hour later, we repeat the gas, a pH of 7.37, a PCO2 of 6.6, .6, and PO2 of 8.9. And congrats, you've fixed the patient. At this point, we'll make sure the patient's on a cardiac and a respiratory monitor, repeat the gas in 4 hours, and take it from there. If, however, the patient's gases or clinical condition deteriorate, it's probably worth checking the ceiling of care and whether ITU actually needs to be involved in this case early and consider intubating and ventilating. Finally, in terms of contraindications for both CPAP and BiPAP, if a patient has an advanced directive, it's worth considering that. And if there's a risk of aspiration or vomiting, low GCS, an undrained pneumothorax, recent GI surgery, or an obvious GI obstruction, we shouldn't be using either CPAP or BiPAP. So, I hope that helps with the first of the many How Does videos. Be sure to like, comment and subscribe and keep up to date with free online medical content. And just remember, this video wasn't for revision purposes, it's more for use in a practical setting when you're seeing patients in real life. And make sure you follow local policy and your guidance from your seniors as well. See you in the next video.